Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Fargo. We are so excited that you are here to worship with us today. Please stand as we prepare for worship. A uh, reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 41. Uh, verse 40, excuse me. Now, O oh my God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. And now arise, O oh Lord God, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests, O oh Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O oh Lord God, do not turn away from the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. Let's sing today. Let's worship today. Let's cast off whatever it is from this world that has been dragging you down and open yourself up to the glory of the Lord. Let's worship together. Calvary Fargo. We are so excited to have you here in the house of the Lord joining us this morning. It is the Advent season, and this is the time to remember when Christ came to the earth in the incarnational presence of the Lord here. So with that in mind, we want you to stay excited this morning. We want you to enjoy yourselves and just worship as your heart so desires. And with this, at this part of the service is where we take a little bit of time. Oh, and I forgot to greet our pro 
Greetings, our virtual campus and our balcony bunch. I apologize. Good morning. You guys doing well up there? All right. You guys didn't show the balcony bunch any love? Did you guys wave to them? Okay. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. This is the part of the service where we just take a little bit of time to just, uh, if there's anything between you and the Lord that's separating you from the love of the Lord, or maybe you haven't spent that time to really get centered into a place where you can just focus on Jesus this morning, this is the time where we just confess our sins before the Lord, both individually and corporately, and so that we can remove anything that might be standing between us and the Lord so that we can worship freely this morning. So with that, I'm going to read what is in the white, and you will read what's in the gold and the bold. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment of silent reflection between you and the Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And the Word of God tells us if we confess God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you confess that with faith, receive the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we invite you to continue worshiping with us this morning. Satan is back. 
Jesus, sing to the King. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord.
this morning, an offering of worship, an offering of exaltation, an offering of love. There is none like you, O Lord, amongst the gods, who can be compared unto you. Lord, you are glorious in holiness. You are fearful in praises. We are so grateful to you, Lord, for your goodness, for your grace upon our lives. Lord, we just raise up our hands this morning and we say thank you, Lord. We lift up our hearts to you this morning and we say thank you, Lord. There are many, Lord, who have wished to be here today, but they are not here. We are here. It's not because we are better than them, oh Lord, but it's because of your grace and it's because of your mercy. Lord, we are not here for blessings. We just want to sit at your feet this morning and worship you, Lord. We join the 24 elders this morning and say, holy, 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 Lord. We lift up your name above every name. We lift up your kingdom above every kingdom. Lord, this morning, we lift up your name above every situation. And we say, Jesus, you are Lord. Father, open our eyes that we may see you. We just want to see you. We want to love you, Father. Your precious ones are here this morning. And they have lifted up their hands and their hearts to you to say thank you, Lord. Take all the glory, Father. We are here because of you, O oh God. We are not here because of anybody. We are not here because of the praise team. We are not here because of anything, but because of you, Lord Jesus. And that is why we are here, and that is why we will come here again and again, because you are Jehovah God. We worship you. Take all the glory, now and forever, Lord. We worship you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Wow. Greet one another in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The theme for lighting the Advent candles this year is the ordinary Christmas characters of Christmas story, thoughts from the book, The Unlikely Characters of Christmas by Daniel Darling. Through the tender mercies of our God, which with the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, guide our feet into the way of peace, Luke 1, 78 and 79. At the time of the decree of the Roman emperor, Augustus, that all the world would need to register at their birthplace, it had been 400 years 
since God had spoken to his people through Israel, through the prophets. Four centuries of silence. Yet when, in the midst of darkness and no one could be trusted, God was silent, but not sleeping. The news of Israel's deliverer would not come from a palace, but a Jewish house of worship to an aging priest. Zechariah was a common name, but it's not a coincidence that the first words from God to his people in 400 years would come to someone whose name means the Lord has remembered. It's more than ironic that the place God chose to speak was the temple, built by an illegitimate king of Israel and corrupted by spiritual leadership. God was signaling to his people that a new day was dawning. The angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah as he was performing his temple duties. Gabriel announced, your prayer has been heard. What prayer? The prayer of Zechariah and his wife for a child? Or the whispered prayer of every faithful Jew for the coming of the Messiah? Both were answered. As the Advent candle is lit today, we too long and pray for the return of Jesus, the Messiah. Please stand and sing with us. So at this time, um, if you haven't, have an opportunity, this is the time where we can give in our tithes and offering. Uh, we do have a box because of COVID. We don't pass the plate around. Um, but in the back, there is a box. So if you remember to give your tithes and offering, feel free to do that. You can also give online. So all of us who are joining us virtually and you feel that this is part of a congregation, are you feeling that you are benefiting from the teaching and the worship here at Calvary? We invite you also to just um, sow a seed into this ministry and help us do the work here in Calvary Fargo if you're so led by the Lord as the Lord leads you to give. So with that, uh, we're going to ask you to Pay attention in your bulletins. Uh, there are some prayer concerns in there. So just remembering our fellow brothers and sisters who are part of our congregation, just remember to take a moment and time just to pray for them. 
you know, when you're going to bed at night or if you're at your meal or you're just at work, just kind of remember them in your prayers and lift up a prayer to them because the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And in the uh, weekly e-letter I sent out this week, I talked about there's going to be a forum where I'm going to be offering opportunity for small groups of people to get together and have some honest conversation around some of the topics we discussed in the last uh, two, uh, two sermons of the last series on Ashamed where we talked about social righteousness and issues about what does it look like when the gospel uh, intersects with issues, uh, social issues within our community. And again, this is a place where you can just have some open dialogue, conversation, just discuss what that looks like. Uh, this is a place of no judgment. It's a place of just uh, no attribution. You're welcome to say anything you want. So if you haven't figured this out about me, you can ask my staff, and you can ask people who've had conversations with me, who sat with me one-on-one. When I say that, you can ask me absolutely any question. I mean absolutely that. I know that is one of those rare things when people are like, well, can I really ask about this? this thing and not offend, I I offend very easily. What I'm offended about is you uh, pretend like you don't have an issue and then you go out and you like do other things and it's like, okay, just be honest. Uh, You can call me a jerk to my face and we can say, well, let's sit down and talk about that. That's the kind of person I am. You know, it's like I'd rather you just come to me, say what you got to say, let's get it on the table, let's have a great discussion about it. So I'm not offended about any issue whatsoever when you've kind of gone through the whole process of deconstruction. Um and have to question and test everything and look at things from multiple perspectives, you get to a point where you're just like, okay, I understand that point of view. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. And sometimes I'll agree, sometimes I'll disagree. But what we want to do is create a culture where we can be mature around all the subjects that we're discussing, that the person who disagrees with me is not my enemy. God has called us, especially in this season, for this to be a season of love and lifting up one another. And so just because I disagree with you doesn't mean we can't go uh, have lunch together, go to the pretzel place, have a pretzel. It's like, okay, on this issue we disagree and we don't see it eye to eye, but we can still love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And, um, and once you figure out that I'm right, I'll continue to pray for you that you just come to my side. And so, so with that, I'm going to now invite our scripture reader up to lead us in the Apostles' Creed and our scripture reading for this week. Oh, microphone. Yes. Please stand for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then Matthew 1, 18 through 23. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. I also forgot to highlight that we are going to be doing some Christmas decorating this coming Wednesday. So you are all invited out. We're inviting everyone in the church to come out and help decorate the church. We're going to be offering some pizza so you don't have to worry about going home and grab dinner. Great time to come out with the family. We'll feed you and we're just going to make this place pretty and festive and just a reminder of that this is a season to remember Jesus Christ. And so with that, we are starting a new sermon series for the next five weeks, Birthright, in which we're going to be talking about this week, prophecies and promises. And so this uh, season, when we're going to be, Advent season, we're going to be remembering Jesus. We're just going to be talking about what it really means to have that birthright to live into Jesus Christ. So with that, how many happy had an incredible and happy Thanksgiving by a show of hands? That's a lot of hands. How many ate till you passed out? All right, awesome. Even better, even better. I will not, you are absolved of the sin of gluttony for this weekend only as part of the Friday, Black Friday special. So um, speaking of Thanksgiving, there was um, a lady, uh, because when you're doing your sermon prep, the first place you always go is the social media. And so I found an article on Daily Mail, and the Daily Mail article said uh, this young lady had a Friendsgiving and I had never heard of a Friendsgiving. And so maybe you guys have, but a uh, young lady, she was doing a Friendsgiving. She had, about three weeks before Thanksgiving, invited all of her friends. And her friends said, yeah, we would be excited to come. And so, you know, she started preparing her basement. She decorated it. She bought all of this food. She cooked all of this food. And she was preparing for her friends to come over. And she was super excited, telling all of her, telling her boyfriend, yeah, my friends are coming over. This is going to be a great time. And he's like, yeah, this is awesome. And so she gets to the day, the day of Thanksgiving, And she's texting on the group track that she created to let people know, hey, this is how we're going to keep in touch, to coordinate. And she's texting them like, hey, I got the food. I'm getting the food ready. I'm doing the final fixings, everything, and so forth. And she doesn't hear anything back. She's like, okay, they're probably busy. You know, hey, it's a very busy morning. And so she keeps cooking and she keeps preparing the food and the time is getting closer and she's still not hearing anything. Then at the time of the start time, she calls. She's like, hey, is anybody coming? But she's only getting the answer machine. She's getting disconnected. The phone. She's not reaching anybody whatsoever. So she waits an hour. Maybe they're just delayed. So she sits for an hour and she waits. Then another hour goes by and she waits. Then at the three-hour mark, she calls her boyfriend and says, uh, I don't think anybody's coming. And she's completely distraught. The boyfriend comes over. He tries to console her, but there's not anything he can do whatsoever. And so he posts a TikTok video just talking about this terrible incident, you know. My girlfriend did all this preparation. She did all of this work. She tried to, you know, um, was so excited for her friends to show up. And he tried to cheer her up, and there was nothing he could do to cheer her up. She was just crying because her friends had done this way. You know, she had just gotten kind of numb about it, and there was nothing he could do to cheer her up. Now, that's a pretty sad story. It makes you wonder, right? Why would people say something if they don't intend to do it? Broken promises. And I thought about that. Why would people say something if they don't intend to do it? And we're not talking about, you know, you, you, you made a promise and something came up or you had every intention and you meant well and you called the person, but they didn't even call to say that we're not coming. They just completely ghosted her. And so the boyfriend, just so you know that this has a happy ending, the boyfriend called his friends. And says, hey, my girlfriend is putting together this Friendsgiving. Can you guys come over? And they said, man, we got you. 
We got you. We're going to come over. They brought food. They brought uh, all sorts of uh, goodies, and they had a great time. And the, the Thanksgiving was salvaged, and, and, the, and, and they posted a video after that saying that, hey, everything turned out well. And the story went viral. viral. It had over 14 million clicks on the video. And so it's in all these major newspapers, this story about this young lady who invited her friends and none of the friends showed up and then how the boyfriend salvaged the party. And some of the comments said something pretty incredible. One comment that really stood out said this, you just gained a thousand plus more friends. But part of me would wonder is like, why would someone do that? Why say something you don't intend to do? And then I thought about, you know what, that's just a part of our culture. Not everybody's culture, but how many times have you heard someone say, hey, call me sometime? And their intent is not for you to call them. Stop by my house sometime. And if you were to actually stop by their house, they would probably ask you, what are you doing here? All too often we say things we really don't mean. But what's very important about this thing of broken promises is that we have a God of promises who doesn't do that. The God of promises doesn't do that. The God of promise, he makes promises to individuals. He made promises way back to Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. And he kept that promise. Depending on how you define it, the Jewish nation, through that, Came David, became a great nation. Through that became Jesus, who gave us Christianity. And if you're even beyond just a Christian bubble and you just want to look at the religions that identify themselves with Abraham, then you're talking about Islam and some of the other religions too. And you're talking about half the planet attribute their origins to Abraham. I will make you a great nation. But he didn't make a promise to just Abraham. He made a promise to David. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. I just like saying that. Isn't that kind of a very cool word? When I was growing up, you had stuff like when something was really cool, you would say word. Hey, you like that candle? Word. So I figured I would just adopt Selah. So, you know, how, how did you enjoy the service? You guys can just be like, Selah. Very cool. Just a very cool word. But I have made a covenant with my chosen. He said, I was swore to establish your throne forever. And through that, Jesus comes and God keeps his promise. It's interesting. He also makes a promise to nations. He says to Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountain of Israel. He also says in Isaiah, who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day, a nation be brought, into for, be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. And Israel and the Jewish people ascribe this to as when Israel became a state, its own state in 1948, within a matter of a sign of a pen, they became their own nation and was recreated, fulfilling the prophecy. God is a God of promises. And why does God is such a God of promises? Because promises are only good as the person making them. Promises are never about words. We can always say words. Words are cheap. Promises are only good as the character of the person who makes them. And what greater character is there than God who says in the scriptures of God, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And we know the answer to that. God keeps all of his promises. When God speak it, it will come to pass. God is a God of promise. But why is that so important? Why is it so important that God be a God of promise? And how is that connected, connected to birthright? Because birthrights are a form 
of a promise. Birthrights are a form of a promise. We don't really talk about it so much today in our culture within the U.S. But when you're talking about ancient times, when you're talking about medieval times, when you're talking about even royalty, uh, when you talk about royal uh, families such as Prince Williams and all those things, birthright becomes significantly important. And that's because birthright, as defined by Oxford's Dictionary, a thing that somebody has a right to because of their family or country they were born in, and I would say or born again in, or because it is a basic right of all humans. Because of your family or because the nation you're born in, you're entitled to certain rights. So for the believer who's coming into the kingdom of God, as part of the kingdom of God and as part of being born again into the family of God, we're entitled to certain rights. But to really understand that, we have to understand God's big story, which can be drawn out in four phases, as many theologians have done. There are four phases to really understanding the story of God, or if you just want to uh, summarize the entire gospel story, there is creation. God in the beginning created heaven and earth. He created human beings. He created them in his likeness and image. It's the first time God creates in his likeness and image. God created angels. He created the heavens. He created the earth. But then he does this thing, and he says, Let's make man in our image, in our likeness. God procreates. God wants a family. God creates his own family. His family is disobedient. And so then we have the fall. And because of that, sin enters the world. Sin enters the world. Man now has to work. There's uh, pain in childbearing. All these things, curses handed down. But basically what we did is we gave away our birthright. God gave us dominion over all the planet. And when Jesus is tempted in the desert, Satan says to Jesus, hey, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth because they have been given to me. Who were they given to him by? Adam and Eve when they disobeyed in the garden. They relinquished their rights as the children of God. So then we have redemption, of course, when Jesus Christ comes and he dies for us and restoration, the second coming of Jesus. But even in the garden, God loved us so much that he made this promise right after the fall when God was handing down curses. He made a promise to mankind. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. And you will strike his heel. The King James uses the word seed. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. Here's something very interesting. Women don't have seed. Now, if you're young and you're not quite getting that, I'm going to leave that as a parent-child discussion. Sorry to put that on your parents, but that's not this lecture. That's not this sermon. So, um... (laughs) Between her seed and your seed, women don't have seed. And to make a point of this, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. And starting at verse 4, if you have it, are you reasonably close? Say amen. Amen. All right, so the word says, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. Remember that promise earlier that God said he would make a promise to David that it will always stay in your line and be established forever. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And uh, just so a side note, just so you know, that in that culture that people were betrothed to be married, it's not like our culture today. So when you read that, um, before they were young, before they were age of married, they would have been betrothed to one another saying, hey, this child is promised to this child and they're going to be husband and wife. And at that point, they were considered married. So for Mary to be found with child before the marriage is actually consummated is a huge deal. So who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Showing you the fulfillment of what God said. I will establish 
her seed. If you read in Matthew, at the very first chapter of Matthew and genealogy, it is always the father beget the son, the father beget the son, and so and so beget, and so and so beget, because that's the way the seed works. Bob is the son of John. John begets so and so, who is the son of John, who begets so and so, and so and so, and so, and that's the way the process works. It would never include the name of the mother, but here you see God is fulfilling his promise by saying it's going to be her seed. This child is not of human origin. This child is from the Lord himself. But then we go to Matthew chapter 1. And if you have your Bibles close, uh, we're going to see that the promise is fulfilled. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, again, after Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, it says this. But after he had considered this, putting his wife away quietly, divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill when the Lord has said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God fulfills his promises. When God says it, he's going to do it. Because God is honorable, because God is just, because God is loving. And he's a person, he's not a man that he should lie, and he keeps his word. So what does that mean for us? Jesus come, God keeps his promises to give us an opportunity to be reconciled with God, to be redeemed by God. It means this, Christ for the new believer is the ultimate birthright. Christ is the ultimate birthright. It's not treasure, it's not gold, it's not all the other promises. Christ is the ultimate birthright. It says this in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, that's in Christ, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. We become part of the family of God because what Jesus has done for us. There's no other way to the Father but through Christ. But through Christ. And so at this time, I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And here's what I want you to think about. There are some questions in your bulletin. Because with all the promises that God offers... I want you to think about what has God promised you? What has God said to you? What has God spoken to you? What has God asked you to do? What has God trusted you to say, trust me in this and lean not to your own understanding. Just follow through with what I've asked you to do. Just trust me in this because I am a God that has never failed you yet. And are you willing to step out in faith and trust God for what he's asking you to do. Because God's faithfulness has always been great towards us. And he always has a promise that we can stand on. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to just come to be chosen through your son. Lord, that we can be adopted to sonship because of what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, even when we failed you, when Adam and Eve, our great paternal and maternal parents failed, even then, Lord, you said that, you know what, I'm not going to let this just go by the wayside. I'm going to establish a promise. I'm going to decide something now. I'm going to set up a way of escape 
a way of reconciliation, a way of redemption, a way of restoration. We thank you for it. Lord, if we lack the faith to trust you to do what you have called us to do, Lord, then help our unbelief, Lord, and increase our faith so that we can completely rely on you and the work of your son, Jesus Christ. His holy name we pray. Amen.
It's really Christ has won the victory. And so if you're commemorating the victory that Christ won through his death, burial, and resurrection, we invite you to take your communion elements this morning. And if you weren't able to receive the elements, just raise your hand and our ushers will bring them to you. So we take our hearts and minds to the foot of the cross and remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, and at the end, given thanks. He said, this is the blood, my blood, of the new covenant shed for you. As often as you drink, do so in remembrance. Because when you eat of the bread and you drink of the cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death. That is, you preach the gospel until Jesus comes again. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. Lord, this Advent season, as we remember how Jesus invaded upon the earth and came to us, so humble, so meek, so mild. He came to us as a lamb, Lord sacrificed as a lamb, rose again. But he will come again as the Lion of Judah to take back and set things right, God. So we commemorate what he has done, but Lord, we also commemorate what you will do when you come again. Thank you for Jesus. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. So that concludes our service for today. Uh, if you're interested in the Honest Conversations, sign up. Uh, you can do that online if you have the weekly email. If you didn't, I'm going to ask my very nice friend, Miss Beth, to go get a sheet, sign up sheet, and put it out there, and you can just write your names down. There'll be opportunities available this coming Wednesday, Sunday after church on the 5th, and then the following Wednesday. And we're trying to keep the group small, so they'll be limited to around eight-ish so people. All right, so if you're interested in that, just write your name down. We'll contact you, and we'll figure out where you want to be. So with that, receive the benediction. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent, one from another. And the church said... Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord, and love someone that you haven't loved before. <laughs>